Good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Pond. <clears throat> I'm honoured to speak to you today as President of the Royal Society of New South Wales and Chair of the Planning Committee for this year's forum. I'm joined in this opening session by the patron of our society, Her Excellency the Honourable Margaret Beasley, ACQC, Governor of New South Wales, and our moderator and rapporteur for the forum, Dr. Ian Offerman. Welcome to you both. I acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional custodians of the lands on which each of us is living, learning and working today. We pay our respect to elders, past, present and emerging. The Society's annual forums have been held since 2015 in partnership with Australia's Learned Academies. Each forum is dedicated to interdisciplinary discussion and examination of a contemporary challenge that spans the sciences and humanities. This year's forum is no exception, given that we have chosen the theme, power and peril of the digital age. Our outstanding lineup of speakers will frame their observations around the life of the child born today, the 4th of November, 2021. This child is entering a world in a unique moment of history, a moment when the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered a tipping point of historic proportions in terms of the digital age. It has transformed how we live, learn and work forever. There is no going back. The pace of digitalization is only going to accelerate. Perhaps it is fitting that this year's forum is held entirely online. You are joining an audience of hundreds of people from across Australia and even further afield, an audience that is made up of young and old, expert and non-expert. Thank you, Dr. Pond. To everyone watching this morning in New South Wales and far beyond, I'm delighted to join you in this opening session of the Royal Society of New South Wales and Learned Academy's virtual conference. This morning, I'm speaking to you from my office here at Government House, which stands on Gadigal land and by the beautiful Gadigal waters of Sydney Harbour, which are Gamarua to each of you. As we consider the unrelenting pace of the digital age over these next couple of days, I pause to acknowledge the wisdom, the culture, and the continuing connection to lands and the waters and the communities of First Nations people who've lived in this region for at least 60,000 years. Downstairs in the main hall at Government House, there's a very large portrait, I have to say, of the first president of the Royal Society of New South Wales, the society itself being founded 200 years ago and initially known here in Australia as the Philosophical Society of Australasia. The subject of that portrait was an avid astronomer. My predecessor, back born on my birthday, but in a different year, fortunately, Sir Thomas Brisbane, the sixth governor of New South Wales. And it's an honor to continue this long line of vice regal patronage of the Royal Society, whose mission to enrich our lives through knowledge and inquiry is vigorous, vigorously pursued by the society and done with intellectual rigor. The theme of this year's conference is exciting and in many ways it's confronting. People do not necessarily handle change well. Indeed, according to the epitomist Mr. Google, change sits on top of the list of the top 10 fears that people have. Uncertainty ranks number five. And yet, as John F. Kennedy put it so well, Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or live only in the present are certain to miss the future. I commend the Society and Learned Academies Forum for this year's forward-looking theme, Power and Peril of the Digital Age, and to the dynamic way they've sought to focus on these deliberations. We have entered a new age that has already and will continue to change the world, and I would add, most likely, civilization as we know it. The Bureau of Statistics estimates that there is one birth in Australia every one minute and 45 seconds. So a little bundle of joy and potential has been born whilst I've been speaking. 
born into a world of increasing digital complexity, a world which, as you are going to explore, will increasingly bring both power and peril. With a few clicks on your phone, you can access nearly all of human knowledge that exists in our time. The baby's name may have been a family favourite, or the, babe, the parents may have gone back to Mr Google, looked up baby names, and in doing that would have done so along with some 6.9 billion other searches being made at exactly the, on exactly the same day, using the services of a company that is reputed to hold a 92.7 share of the global search market, an issue in itself. And as this little bundle of joy grows, their immunization status will be recorded on an app. Their toddler's clothing will be ordered online and delivered by drone, perhaps. In 2030, aged eight, the child will travel to school on an autonomous school bus, perhaps. 20 years on, in 2050, age 28, this tech-savvy young person will have every aspect of healthcare delivered remotely, will sit through international conferences in a room full of holographs, almost undoubtedly. However, this little person born today also has to live in an actual world. In 2019, the CSIRO published its Australian National Outlook, exploring multiple potential futures for our nation for the next 40 years. The aim was holistic. It was to help Australians continue to enjoy the best quality of life available to any nation and for future generations to have access to even better opportunities. The report also recognised the challenges, and they're in this order. The rise of Asia, technological change, obviously, climate change and environment, also obviously, demographics, trust and social cohesion. And the report modelled two scenarios. First, it's entitled a slow decline, should we fail to adequately address these and other issues. And in its second scenario, it called an outlook vision that called for decisive action and a long-term view to achieve positive outcomes. And the modelling demonstrated that the difference between these two scenarios, a slow decline and a positive outlook vision, was large, but it was worth fighting for. Whilst the immediate future of our little birthday baby is in our hands today, the longer-term future for that baby, that child, that young person is not so certain. And this uncertainty underscores that what we are discussing here over the next two days is intensely pragmatic and fundamentally important. I congratulate the forum and the organisers on this collaboration between the Society and the Australian Academies of Health and Medical Sciences, the Humanities, Science, Technology, Technology and Engineering, and the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, which creates such a deep well of expertise to discuss this future, which is so worth fighting for. My thanks again to Susan Pond, President of the Royal Society of New South Wales and Chair of the Planning Committee for the Forum. The representatives of the Learned Academies who formed the Program Committee are two lead speakers, Australia's Chief Scientist, Cathy Foley, my welcome, and New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer, Hugh Durant White, again, I welcome you, Hugh, good to see you. And our moderator, Dr. Ian Ackerman, New South Wales Chief Data Scientist and Industry Professor, the University of Technology, Sydney. And with those brief words, can I turn you over to the experts for an accelerating two days? And it is my pleasure now to officially open the Royal Society of New South Wales and Learned Academies Forum 2021. Thank you very much, Susan. It's my absolute pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I join you from, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So, my name is Ian Opperman, and I am your moderator and rapporteur for the next, for today and tomorrow. Before we begin, i just remind you of a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, today's event, of course, is brought to you by the Royal Society of New South Wales in conjunction with the Five Learned Academies, and it's with support of the Public uh, Sector Network. The event is being recorded for the purposes of sharing information with other parties. I'd like to direct your attention to the resources link in your, on your console, 
Uh, we've included today's agenda in a series of additional reading materials for you to access before, during, or after the event. Uh, all the windows on your console, console are movable and recitable, and you can set up and alter your, your viewing experience to make it more comfortable for yourself. Uh, we'd love to hear from you throughout the event, so if you have any questions for the speakers or a question you'd like to pose to our panellists during the discussions or until later, uh, please feel free to submit using the Q&A tool. There's also a group chat that, where you can connect with other attendees and speakers who are presenting today, so open up the group chat and let everyone know that you're joining us. So I'd, I'd like to begin by trying to frame the agenda just a little. Now, we've already heard that what we're trying to do is think through some of the challenges of the future world. And I, it's always interesting when you ask people to think about the future. Very often, people are comfortable talking about the next five years or maybe even the next 10 years. With some exceptions, our infrastructure planners certainly think much further into the future. But most people beyond 10 years will very quickly leap to the idea of jetpacks and flying cars and hoverboards, which may or may not be true, but when we think about the future, the, our ability to think into that space is often quite limited by our, our understanding of real issues of substance. Today, what we're going to do is talk about the near, medium, and longer term future by using, as was described, the idea of a child born today. Child born today will live to the world of 2030, which is a world currently being discussed very actively around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, a view of the world that we'd like to see. You no know, poverty, zero hunger, good health, smart, sustainable cities. And for many people, 2030 is about as far as they can think into the future before it starts to fall apart, before our frameworks to think about the future start to de degrade. But 2030 and the world of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is, is a very real, real environment that Australia has signed up to, many countries around the world have signed up to. In so many different domains, we are starting to think about what we could actually do to deliver on the goals of the Sustainable Development, the sustainable development Goals. But as mentioned, if we think beyond 2030, we really need to start to think about the fact that our child born today will only be nine years old by the time we hit to 2030. If we make it to 2050, that child will be 28, 29 years old. It almost certainly will be in the second or third job and has many, many more years life ahead of it. But that child born today is born into a global population of approximately 7.9 billion people. By 2030, it's expected to be 8.5 billion people. And by 2050, it's expected to be 9.5 billion people. So already we have starting to see the challenges of sustainability. If we have an extra, by 2030, an extra billion people on the planet, there's no more land, there's no more water, there's no more natural resources. We have what we have. Every one of those people will live longer. More and more people will live in urban environments. And increasingly, we all expect an improved quality of life. So the question then is about sustainable intensification. By 2050, we expect that to be 9.7 billion people. And by the end of the century, when our child born today will, will still be hopefully retired, but we'll still be living, we'll still expect quality of life, we'll still expect to, to, to improve how, how they live. We expect the global population to be over 11 billion people. Again, compared to today's 7.9 billion people, that's an extra 3 billion people. And again, no more land, no more water, no more natural resources. And increasingly, we expect more and more of the world's population to be living in less structured, less planned environment, and yet still expecting to have an improved quality of life. Increasingly, we're expecting to see autonomous, intelligent devices helping us with that challenge of sustainable intensification. We are really looking at a productivity challenge. Not only do we have an older, aging, increasing population, the implications, of course, of that is if we still are all retiring at the same age, the ratio of people retired to people working will change quite dramatically over the course of the life of this child. 
So we have a productivity challenge as well, where fewer, relatively speaking, fewer and fewer people are supporting an increasingly retired population. So some things will need to change. And it's inevitable that our reliance on digital and data services will increasingly drive the need for that increased productivity and that sustainable intensification. And finally, of course, we know that our world doesn't stop in 2030. We know that the trends of societal change, of technological change, of environmental change will continue. 2030 is the decade before 2040, which is the decade before 2050. And as we think about the life of the child, living through to the, the world of the 22nd century, the challenges we face now are challenges which will increasingly accumulate. So we expect an increasing dependence on technology, we expect an increasing dependence on digital and data and AI as we increase, as we move through that journey of the child. So today's session is really about the setup. What does the future look like? What are the important issues that we need to bear in mind as we think about our dependence on technology, our increased use of data, our increased use of digital, our increased use of AI? Tomorrow is about what do we do about it? What are the issues we should be thinking about now? What are the actions we should be taking now to think our way through that safer space between yes, we should and no, we shouldn't, between where we absolutely must or we absolutely must not? Thinking our way through that space will enable us, I hope, to start to identify actions we should take today in 2021 to think about that future world and to prepare ourselves for the future. Now we have today, today is the fun part. Today we get to do the setup and we have some really amazing speakers joining us today. Our, our next speakers are Kathy Foley and Hugh Durrett White, who are respectively Australia's chief scientist and New South Wales chief scientist and engineer, who are going to offer us the first perspective on science and technology underpinning the digital age. We'll continue to talk then about health. We'll talk about that future digital child. We'll think our way through some of the most important salient aspects of that future world. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over, over to Cathy Foley. Please, Cathy.